Welcome to Unwarranted Music Opinions, a podcast in which three music fans choose an album, force each other to listen to their picks, and we reconvene to discuss what we thought about them. I am June Lindbergh, and I'm here with Brian Courtney. Hello. And Chaz Jenkins. Hello. <laughs> and this is a regular episode, no theme, no, no limitations on what we can choose, and I decided to go with the 1993 experimental post-punk wonderful album that is Hum of Life by Dog-Faced Hermans. Dog-Faced Hermans are a band that formed in the sort of mid to late 80s in Edinburgh, Scotland, fronted by Marion Coots, who is a wonderful, wonderful human being. They are kind of post-punky, kind of experimental there's a lot of noisy guitars there's trumpet there's almost post hardcore esque grooves sometimes uh, and there's also a lot of influence from the no wave scene back in the late 70s early 80s artists like lydia lunch the contortions that definitely come through in all of the brass instrumentation and the really weird jazzy noisy stuff that goes on here there's a lydia lunch cover there is an ornette coleman cover who's one of the big free jazz artists and free jazz having a pretty marked influence on stuff like this where the the, you know the trumpet just goes wild and everything is just generally fairly chaotic though this definitely is a written album in that every single moment feels like it was designed to be the way that it is it's not even a really particularly spontaneous record in the way that something like Tokyo Anal Dynamite last week would have been. Uh, It's very cohesive and put together because I think that on a lot of the tracks here, there are points being made. It's really just like a, a focused punch to the face of energy. I love this album. It's kind of a June pick. It's like right up my alley. So I'm excited to hear what you all have to think. One quick note, it's interesting that you mentioned like everything feels planned. There's only one track where it feels even remotely spontaneous, and that's Peace Warriors, the closer. That's the one time I- It's actually a cover. Yeah, it's the one time where I feel like they just kind of randomly did some stuff to to add to the chaos. That's just the one note I wanted to make. It's funny they mentioned that. Uh, This sounds great. It is probably the best post-punk anything you've picked for the show. I had to think long and hard about which one was like my favorite before this. And upon further examination, it was probably Throwing Muses or The Waitresses. I feel like those two were like, the more I thought about it, the more coming back to the track listings of those albums. I think those two were like the ones to beat. This one surpasses those by far. Because I think my scores on those have gone down a little bit. But this one, I've done the listens. I think I did four listens for this album. And... I gotta say, front to back, this album kicks so much ass. I think the first thing I want to talk about is the fucking bass on this album. It makes me very uh, horny. (laughs) No. 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 It's so... That's... that's you had to think of a word. You're like, I want to make this like a sexual thing. And instead of saying like, oh, this bass is good, you're like, this bass makes me... Uh, horny. <laughs> like the <laughs> slowdown. Oh my god. God damn you. <laughs> it makes me horny. Jesus Christ. It does though. It's so. The production on this album leaves so much for the instrumentation to just shine. The bass, the guitar, the drumming. It's all awesome. But what really kicks ass is the trumpet and violin on this record. They don't come in all the time, but when they do, they add so much to the music. Like, it's funny that I brought up Throwing Muses. I I said in that review that there's a lot of memorable musical moments. This one has them Mm -hmm. in spades. Like, there's so many moments that I keep coming back to. And speaking of the trumpets, the trumpet and how we connect, the way the... Oh, it's so good. I could listen to that for hours. So this is in a similar vein to the stuff that June's brought to the show before with Throwing Muses, basically female-led. But there is huge band. differences sonically. Right, sonically. But in general, as an idea, female-led 
bands, usually mostly female or uh, lineups, uh, to my knowledge, with like all of them. The, the raincoats, you know, like it, it's just to the see. theme of the bands that we talked about on the show before. That's basically that's been come to known as June Core. Um, <laughs> and you know, in that vein, and usually the topics too are explicitly uh, feminine as well, and deal with like you know primarily with women's issues not always that's not like 100 percent the case for every track on all the albums we've done but in general those are the prevailing themes on those <clears> records <throat> and that and that's true for this record too the difference between this record and those records is that while the those other the, you know the throwing muses the waitresses while most of those have fallen out of any listening cycle i have i, I literally never came back to them this God one you. probably has that staying power and this one i think easily so too. has the best songs and the best performances of all of those records. Mm-hmm. Fan, um, yeah, the song, the progressions here are extremely linear. You know, there's a lot of repetition, a lot of groove riding, and and adding to the groove as it goes, or coming in with big crescendo moments, and sometimes like coasting out on a much quieter groove than they rode in on. But there's no real verse, chorus, verse, chorus here a lot of the time, which has been the case for a lot of the records we've covered in that vein, or at least for throwing muses. But what I can appreciate on this record is that I think there is a lot of thought given to making these songs memorable while still being linear and still being very wild and kind of unkempt. The energy is unrivaled on this record by any of the other records we covered in this vein and, and a lot of records we covered on the show even. And the production is way tighter than all of those records, which is on purpose, because I know with stuff like Raincoats and Throwing Muses, you know, those things are particularly kind of lo-fi, whereas, like, the Waitresses record is a little more, you know, is not, like, the most clean production I've ever heard, but, you know, it was cleaner than those records, but this one is, like, spotless. Everything is super clear, super crisp, sounds exactly like it should, comes off exactly as it's presented, and um, adds a lot to each track. They are accented and enhanced by the amazing vocal performances and lyrical content consistently across the record. It is probably one of it is one of the best records he's brought to the show. Yeah, no, er- everything Brian said is totally true. Talking about the production, that is where I have a little bit of issues with the album, but these are definitely nitpicks. There are two songs where the vocals which are awesome. Uh what was uh what was the woman's name again, the lead singer? Marion Coots. Marion's vocals are fantastic. They vibe so well with the music, especially on Madame La Mer. The way that uh, she holds that Madame La Mer, the music kind of like, uh, it, just, it just clicks so well there. However, her vocals are mixed under the instrumentation in two songs, Vita and Hook in the Wire, which is kind of disappointing because... I think that takes away oh, from it. Oh, what? The Hook and the Wire vocals are amazing. The, 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 both those songs are fantastic. No, they are. The Hook no. and the Wire is probably my favorite song on the album. I don't know. I think Hook and the Wire is kind of one of the weaker tracks compared to the other. No way. Oh, yeah, no. No way. And, and, I'm and not... the energy, the, the bass, that bum ba bum ba bum ba bum I mean, no. Bum, 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 it's, it's awesome. It's just so intense. Yeah, it's awesome. And her vocals, the... It, it, it's almost whispered. Like, I love that she can go from a, from shouting and yelling to this, like, just this, like, almost hissed kind of thing. I love, and, like, and there's so much personality, especially on Hook and the Wire, like, the bit where she goes, dirty little, dirty little, little, dirty little, dirty little. Yeah. Like, and you don't really know what she's saying at first, right? Because it's not all that clear. But in the context of that track, which is one of the shorter moments, one of the more just hardcore punk one of simpler songs, even though there is like still a good amount of instrumentation happening, that's probably the most for me intense song on the album. And especially when you take into consideration the lyrical content of that song, which we can get into when we talk about the lyrics. Did you get what that song was about, Chaz? It's about abortion. Yeah, it's about a back alley right. kind of... Coat hanger, yeah. Yeah. And when she gets into that that low register, that almost whispered, where she's kind of, I think, taking on a, she's kind of just like presenting how society is seeing this event or how certain people are seeing this event. She's painting this picture of this thing that is happening. And there's a certain point where she kind of presents the point of view of people who are shaming this woman. Uh, with the dirty little, dirty little, 
uh, thing there and, and just as a way to cement even further how difficult of a situation that it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then just ending the song with she's wearing a coat too thin for the weather. Yeah, that's a great uh, While song. instrumentation all starts to kind of fall away and you just get like a little bit of a noisy guitar and it just ends suddenly. Oh, God, it's an absolutely fantastic No, song. I don't disagree with you. I think it's a great song, but I don't know, June, compared to songs like Jan 9, Viva, How We Connect, Love Split With Blood, it's a great song, but compared to those, I think it's kind of weaker. I think it... Like, mm-hmm. and, and that's... And that is honestly a praise because even when I think a song is weak, I still think on its own, it's still just a fantastic track. I do still think that the vocals on Vita are too low. They're mixed under the music. And I think that takes away from it. I don't know why it's like that on that song and none of the other songs, because in the other songs, she's right up front. She's where she should be. I think it detracts from that tune, but the music in that well then makes up for it. Talk about some more musical moments that just blew me away. The drum breakdown in Vita, that quick drum breakdown where like the bottles and stuff like come in, like the ding, da, da, ding, da, ding. I don't know. that. That's really cool. Uh, the I lose nothing in this attempt chanting moment. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. And the drums and violin beginning of Love is the Heart of Everything, which is probably my favorite track. Da, 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 da. Oh, man. That is sp- Spicy, so spicy. This album is just fucking groovy throughout. I do think, however, White Indians is probably the worst song in the album. Yeah, it's not one of my favorites. It really um, leaves me scratching my head. It's because, the shortest. It, well, it's the shortest, but it also, I mean, she just repeats this line over and over. And I kind of really, it doesn't help that I don't really understand what the song's about. I mean, I can make assumptions, right. but the music doesn't really go anywhere. Every track besides this go somewhere you know brian said repeating the groove and then adding things in this one doesn't do that it just kind of goes and then it ends and it's just kind of like we could have used this space for a much better song or we could have done much more with this song in particular so i don't know that's a that's a weak moment but besides that i just kind of see it as a cool down between wings right, and right. one of my favorite songs on the album here the dogs I don't, which yes. i yes Love Hear the Dogs. Yes, Hear the Dogs is awesome. And Hear the Dogs is another example of like one of my favorite things about this album is how many moments Marion has. She just kills the vocals on this thing. Like how many moments where you just remember not only what was said, but how she said it. On Hear the Dogs, this is some country. This yes, is the groove like, during it, that oh. song. The groove during that line is phenomenal. It, it is God tier. I don't know. I think Wings is a good cool down. I think that's the cool it's down great. song. It, yeah. It's great. It's like one of the quieter songs. I think White Indian, White Indians in terms of like where it is on the album is totally a waste because of what Wings has already accomplished what White Indians should do. I kind I like the groove on White Indians. I do like the vocal performance, but I mean it is one of the most lacking songs and its position on the album is kind of questionable too. I think Wings is fine. I think Wings yeah. works, serves as that cool down. Wings doesn't have Wings is still super it's something that I, I don't think either of you have touched on. Is super. Some of these songs are a little. I don't know. They do sound kind of transcendental to me in terms of performance. Because yes. she, Marion, just what I like more about this record than some of the other records and how they cover the topics is Marion makes proclamations. Um, yes. She is not. You There's know, still... she is to whether she is using them to describe a situation or convey a way of thought or you know she is telling you what is going. Yes. On. One she of the is, things I've. Sorry, Brian. One of the things that I've always had a problem with post-punk in general is that the punk elements are sometimes lost. And I think this album has it like just as strong as the post elements, I guess we'll call them. Because like you said, Brian, the way she proclaims these things, it's like protesting. It's just so fucking punk. So I think I think well, the way a good like, balance. So the way previous records, the way previous records have covered it. And June, you said this as well. You said you like music that sounds like your friends could have made it. And they definitely sound like the, those other records sound like people conveying thoughts over music, writing songs like, you know, like it, it, I guess it's hard to explain the difference. But what I'm trying to say is that on those records, and I'm just using them for comparison because that's kind of, you know, they're in that same vein, even though they're not the same, is on 
the raincoats record, on the waitresses record, and on the throwing muses record, at least not as much as is going on here, they are part of the song. And Marion Marion is kind of above the song in a way. It's hard to explain that feeling, but she comes over these tracks and over these instrumentals becomes God, basically, and is shouting the like and not all the time but is shouting these things over the track and that to me is what makes it super engaging she is like look at us this is not a story being told just one that is um i don't know it's like the story's not told it's like i'm actually witnessing it through these perfectly written lines like imagery as opposed to you know like you know there's not there i don't think there's a lot of I guess the lyrics being a little more cryptic here and a little more and harder to pin down than on some of those other records definitely appeal to me more than those other records is what I'm trying yeah, to say. And yeah, and uh, they, give it, I they give it a much larger than life feel for me. And that, to me, makes the record much more palatable, much more engaging. Probably an actual issue with me, though, is the lyrics. Not saying they're bad. I think they're way mm-hmm. too cryptic. Where I find myself no becoming way. a little... Like, there's some songs it's obvious what she's singing about. Hook in the Wire is, a, is the best example. But like Jan 9, Viva, actually. Jan 9 has an obvious meaning too. It's poetic. Jan 9 is about basically ethics in science. So Jan 9 and Future Time, the day science clipped its wings, nobody flew. We all sit around shaking hands on the ground. It's a metaphor. The only song here where I, I, and like Here of the Dogs, you know what Here of the Dogs is about? Uh, Here of the Dogs is essentially about immigration. I I kind of got it. You know, uh, yeah. There is a backstory to that one. It's actually about a specific incident that happened in the UK where the police brought dogs and raided this, like, some, some, like, warehouse or supermarket or something and actually raided it with the dogs because there were undocumented immigrants working there. When she shouts, hear the dogs barking outside, it makes you kind of put into the position of, like, holy shit. All you're doing is working at this place, and they brought fucking dogs. There's the beginning where she's just so sarcastic, where she's saying, welcome, welcome, like almost like a circus performer. Yeah. Where she's taking, or she's pretending that, you know, is whoever's in charge. I'll give you the freedom of my own home, and you may butter your bread on the one side only. So, you know, yeah, yeah, it's super free it's great it's great but you have to listen to everything i say yeah uh Look, there is ca- there's a caveat there uh and just that this is some country this is yeah. where she says it was just such she's just so pissed off on that song and it's fantastic look i'm not knocking any of the lyrics because i think they're stellar it's just it's kind of a problem i have with throwing muses where it's hard to relate sometimes when it's difficult for me to figure out what you're saying however the instrumentation and performances and the vocals, like any issue I have is thrown out the window once the track starts. Like I really don't care. Even if I don't understand what she's singing about or what they're trying to convey, the music I'm so raptured in that any issue I have is, it's, it's just more of an issue I have on retrospect. But when I'm listening to the album, I'm not like, oh, what does that mean? Or what does she mean by that? I'm like, oh my God, this fucking bass. <laughs> like that's just what I'm thinking the entire album. So... I guess most of the, my things are just nitpicks, you know, the more I think about it. But I still think that the the mixing issues on our vocals kind of leaves me wondering why they do it on one track or two and not the rest. I think it just makes those sounds, those songs sound more menacing. Maybe. Given I, it it the, does on Hook and Wire. I think it does on Hook and the Wire. Vita, I don't think it does. I think it really detracts from her vocals when they do that. And then White Indians, I'm like why is this here? You're like, what are you trying to say? You're not really adding anything that other songs have already done much better. Overall, I'm thinking like a strong A. This kicks so much fucking ass, June. This is like top tier post-punk. And nobody really knows about this band. 93. Like, Woo. They're somewhat known. I think maybe it's because they got their more well-known albums came out in the nineties when post-punk wasn't as big. And they're also from the UK. Uh, they're just kind of a little behind. They definitely have some post-hardcore elements where it definitely sounds like a '90s record. And, and the drums, some of those bass like the production lines, is, very, is more. Some of those bass lines are a little heavier. funk metal. Like I got a little Primus vibe from some of those. Like especially Hook on the yeah, Wire. That bass line is pretty less Claypool. 
it, this is an absolutely wonderful record. I don't like comparing it to Throwing Muses or the Waitress, like especially the Waitresses, which is a new wave pop rock group, basically. There's it was pretty much zero similarities. Uh, there are some major uh, between, post-punk elements in that album, though. There are post-punk elements, but it's a completely different style. Uh, I would compare this to more Deceit, if anything. Yes, that would be the that would be my closest comparison of stuff that I've chosen. And I think would be it, I think it, some of the louder moments, some of the groovier moments, some of like a uh, just the groovy moment on Paper Hats. It, it definitely sounds, yeah. That that would be my first go to. Like think and Throwing knocks, Muses even is more an indie rock record and than a post punk. Right, record, I think it knocks the, where deceit, we talked about it. I think it knocks Deceit out of the water. I really do. Like I would rather come to this than Deceit, and I like Deceit a lot. It's just this one, it's just like we're going to fucking groove the whole time and it doesn't stop. Yeah, I mean, this is, I guess the only reason I bring up those other records is because it's like the core, uh, they all sound distinct. I'm not saying they sound the same. They may cover some of the same things topically, but they approach it completely different in each case. It's um, just all June core, really. Right. That's why I bring it up because it's in that same vein, like you said when we started, like of those records. Um, right. But they are completely distinct, and this one is the best one uh, that I've heard. It's my favorite. It's um, like it would be this uh, waitresses, then raincoats, then throwing muses, personally. But this one is like this one was the first one that I think really captured me and captivated me. I love how we connect. That is like one of my favorite songs we've done on the show. I love Madame La Mer and like this. The best thing about her as a vocalist is she does not care if she is just colossal over these songs you know and she really really just adds another layer to them another like fantastic layer like it, it's I, I think this band really uh nailed it with this record i don't know i have barely any complaints it has amazing vocal performances uh really memorable lyrical like tidbit you know uh moments and a lot of the instrumentation is super memorable too or at least super engaging or you know hype uh, so yeah, I'm also feeling like a decent to a strong eight on Hum of Life. Super, super great record. So, Waitresses wasn't Tomorrow Wonderful is a 10 out of 10. Uh, Raincoat's debut is a 10 out of 10. Throwing Muses in a Doghouse, uh, Doghouse Cassette is a 10 out of 10. Hum of Life by Dogface Hermans gets a strong nine. <laughs> Oh, it's so close. Because <laughs> I just wanted to, I just wanted to, to, to spite all of you who are like, oh yeah, it's better than throwing muses. And I'm like, look, I adore this album to death. It's like probably top 100 of all time for me at this point. I absolutely love a sound to death, but I still absolutely love those albums, and they still are very, very special to me as well. Um, I do think that this album is a little front loaded um, in terms of my favorite songs. I would say my favorite songs are Jan Nine. Hook in the Wire, How We Connect, and Hear the Dogs. Those four I have played so much, like over the past few months, like over maybe since August, September. So almost a year at this point. I have listened to those songs so many times. I'll just put those four on in a row and just blast them. They're freaking, they're, they're incredible. Uh, yeah, so Strong Nine, Dog Face Termins. I'm glad you all liked it. I figured with the energy and the just the grooviness that it might be easier for you all to get into um, and how direct some of these songs are. Closer's weak. It's a weak-ass closer. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's all no, right. No, it's not. It's all right. It's a very good... It's actually grown on me more the more I listen to it. it no, fuck you. <laughs> fuck you. The album I've picked is Kainoa by famed Hawaiian musician Israel... Kama Kawiole. Yeah, oh. dude, I knew you could do yeah, it. Yeah, you had to try. You had I to told at least you, try. I told you you could do it. Probably, you do it, but you probably it. botched that. We'll just call him Iz from now because that's what he goes by. I-Z, Iz. Uh, so this is Iz's debut album. Came out in 1990. Basically, like your classic Hawaiian tunes with some other styles kind of mixed in on a few different tracks. Uh, ukuleles. Slacked guitars, fun drums, and bass uh, with Iz's gorgeous vocals over top. This album is nothing special. It's like not doing anything groundbreaking. It's just fun, feel-good music that, especially with what's going on in the world right now, was, has been like 
a weight lifted off my shoulders to listen to. The way I discovered this artist was that I've seen him before. Like I've kind of known about the his classic Over the Rainbow and What a Wonderful World cover. However, I didn't know who he was, <laughs> what he did. No, 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 Brian. There is another version of the Over oh, the Rainbow, What a Wonderful World on his next album, which was actually his breakout album. Yeah, Facing which Future. It's a lot more folky. It's a lot more of the Hawaiian stuff. Yeah. I feel like musically, a lot of his album, while there is some Hawaiian folky tracks on here, a lot of it's very pop reggae. A lot of it felt very yeah. Caribbean. Yeah. And most of the songs in here are covers with a few originals thrown in. And it's just fun. It's vibey. It has a lot of which charm songs, to it. Which songs are the originals? Uh, I believe Kainoa, uh, track three, four, I want to say six, eight, nine, and ten, I think are originals. Don't quote me on that. It, there's, it, there really isn't anywhere to specify. Okay. I, know, I know for a fact two and seven are... They're, I, I will say, the first two so- like the first two covers, Margarita, Coney Island, Washboard Women, are really good. Set the tone. His voice is really pleasant. The playing is, you know, it's nothing special, but it's just, you know, it's super pleasant. Kainoa is actually a super good original song. Probably like Best my song on the album. On the album. Just yeah. like super yeah. stripped back, super sweet. Uh, I'll Be There, Warren's song is also really nice too. Yeah. This album dies on men who ride mountains. And what? it never, uh, ever you, is resuscitated. You know, it is from... That song starts, and I have checked out completely because not only is there nothing memorable or pleasant about it from that there guitar on out, solo is pretty good. Becomes, that guitar solo is pretty good. This becomes complete like <laughs> elevator music after track after track five. Total total waste of vibrations. <laughs> like if vibrations were a finite resource, the last half of this album would qualify as total waste. And, you know, <laughs> It, it, it's not particularly <laughs> it's not it's not like suffering because it's bad i mean it's pl- you know the playing is fine his singing is fine it's just so glazed over eyes at that point i mean men who ride mountains is bad i don't like that song like you know full of i'll but talk it, about my opinions after you get done ranting it's just like six on just make it stop you know, super. I mean, talk, you want to talk about how Dogface Hermans was front loaded. This thing only has a front. <laughs> like, there is no back to load. <laughs> like, there's nothing. The, the cannon is not that big. Like, it is just, oh man, it's rough. It's rough after track six. It's just okay. so boring. So, this is basically an easy listening album, uh, which is a weird genre because it's just supposed to be easy listening, like elevatory kind of music, like just stuff that you might hear in a grocery store or something like that. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, but it also doesn't necessarily uh, define what sound you're going to be hearing. So it's kind of interesting that, like it's a weird label. Uh, and again, just with the Hawaiian folk music, there's only really a few tracks here uh, and it's the originals. Uh, and they're by far, far and away, um, with the exception of a couple other of the covers, my favorite tracks on the album, the ones that are just the acoustic instrumentation plus vocals, like the title track, and uh, it's Hawaiian, so I can't pronounce it, but track four, mm-hmm. Kanai Apuni or whatever. And stop. Both of those are really good. So I, I really enjoyed those two tracks. Um, and it makes sense that Facing Future, his album that came out three years after this, was his breakout album and made him somewhat famous, uh, especially in Hawaii, for all of those songs. It, it's a lot more folky, apparently. I haven't heard it, but I've sampled it and I've looked into what it, it's a lot more just... Facing future it has a lot more of those trick track songs. Facing future is, is more mature. Yeah, is is more mature sophomore. It has more originals, less covers. Yeah. It's more dense. It has much more to offer. This is a lot of pop reggae. We start with Margarita, which is kind of just uh, a it's banger nice. opener. I don't love it. It's a nice <laughs> opener. You know, I I still like it. It's it's fun. It's uh, it's got his vocals and he's likable throughout this whole thing. Even on the songs that I don't really like, 
still a likable dude. Uh, you know, rest in peace to Iz. Uh, Coney Island Washboard Woman is a great cover. It's very... Don't, uh, act, like, don't act like you knew him like that. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. Uh, Coney Island Washboard Woman is uh, probably my favorite track on the record. It's a cover of like a so 20s... You Rack know, time. like a, it, it's kind of do yeah, yeah 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 well not do up but like ragtime yeah um and the folk cuts on the back half of the album uh i do like but not love hano hano o cowboy i don't know if that's an original or not but it's another stripped back mostly acoustic plus vocals track i like track five i'll be there warren song it's definitely like that pop soul pop reggae kind of feel and it doesn't have too much that's interesting about it but it, i'm still enjoying the album the female backup it's vocals like, it's, it's, the, it's his vocal performance on that track well the female vo- the female backup vocals add a lot to that track especially in the outro they do the background i actually ended up really liking the background vocals uh on that song but i agree with brian that the back half of this album really takes a turn uh oh, men who fucking... ride mountains is not good i don't like that track it's just very so what you're telling me the guitar solo on that song is so bad it's so the electric guitar solo i didn't feel like this album needed anything like that like it sort of sucks the personality out where where this album has a lot of personality and is enjoyable to listen to is when is is front and center when it gets to the longer instrumental portions of just like the most bass forward easy listening pop soul with the stupid electric guitar solo uh the over the rainbow what a wonderful world i'm not into it i definitely would prefer if it was hawaiian instrumentation that the style of folk music but again it's another it's like a pop reggae pop soul track that just ends up being kind of grating hano hano o cowboy i like i think that's a decent song sea of love is okay and the closer is not good. The closer with the saxophone, like it just felt like you have his personality on the first half of the album, and on a little like still vocally throughout the whole record. But by the end of it, the instrumentation has just been whittled down, and everything that I like about it is basically gone. It's not terrible. You get to it's track not, six, and it's like it's not horrible. It's still not an album that. I have a hard time sitting through. I think I might like it more than Brian does. I don't think that it's just like some of the worst music ever. Uh, I think it's terrible. But the back half of the album, like when the saxophone comes in, it just feels so manufactured and you lose authenticity of some of, especially his original tracks, which are very good. Um, I would rather listen to, you know, and I don't know if Facing Future, his next record is mostly original acoustic songs but if it is that would be the one that i would choose every single time over this one Um, because he's really a very good singer and a good instrumentalist and the vibe here is just so pleasant and calming and that's kind of what allows me to actually sit through the back half rather than just wanting to turn it off is because i'm still like okay it's still a easy going it's not offensive to the ears but it just doesn't grab you either for me so what you're telling me is that you guys don't like anything fun. You guys have no hearts. You have your black, blackened hearts. Your fucking post-punk industrial hip hop has just ruined any sense of enjoyment for good music. Fuck you guys. Chaz, the first five tracks happen and it's like, all right, Chaz has done it. He's picked some winner. I would have never heard about it if he hadn't picked it. And then track six comes on, and it's like, what has happened? <laughs> like, like, that's honestly what it feels like. It's like, what happened? Look. <laughs> if this were the first five songs, I would love this thing. But look, it's not. Oh, dude. What I, were they thinking? Like, I'm sure well, everything debut... likable about the album exists on the first five tracks. And then after that, it's either mind-numbing or awful. <laughs> look. All right. Let me get my piece in. Hindsight is twenty twenty. This is his debut. You know, who knows? Who knows? Like what the context is, what the background is. So I'm sure this was maybe a studio head coming in and being like, "Hey, you got to have this, this, and this if you want to make it in the big time." You know, who knows? Personally, 
The album falls flat for me by track eight. The last three tracks is when I'm starting to tune out. I don't think they're bad. I don't think there really is a bad song on here. I think those don't really bring to the table what the songs before it do. Personally, I like Men Who Ride Mountains. I think it's a really cheesy, fun song. You know, I love the guitar solo. I love the, pretty the keyboards. Ambitious, pretty ambitious to make it half an hour long, I gotta say. <laughs> It's a breeze. I don't like. The, it's really easy listening. Is the perfect way to describe. <laughs> it's like a breeze in a blizzard. Like, <laughs> like you know. <laughs> Look, shut That's up, Brian. What it feels like Brian. Come on. I think his vocal. I think you might be a little too cynical, but I I mostly agree with Brian. Right. I can be I mean, bored and offended. That boring is can be just as bad as actually. I don't think terrible. it's boring though. I think it's so relaxing and fun and doesn't take itself too seriously. Facing future, on the other hand, he does <laughs> He's gonna hate my record. <laughs> God no. Facing future actually is longer, but he deals with a lot more stuff. Uh, he's more introspective on it. I think we'll definitely talk about this artist again in a sequels down the way. I think I would, I would like to listen to Facing Future. I would really not, love to yeah, hear I would, what you guys hmm. think of Facing Future. Because I was worried, like, that's maybe what I should have started with. I think this album, it's only 34 minutes. It's fun. It's laid back. His vocals are gorgeous. I love the ukulele, the guitars, the keyboards. June, I do think you're right. Some of this stuff does feel kind of tacky. Like, doesn't need to be there. I think the acoustic elements are what really shine about this album. But when it's cheesy and fun, like, that's just it. It's cheesy and fun. It's not offensive. But not in like a Seether surface level way. It's just fun. Look, man, I would never, if it makes you feel any better, I would never compare this to Seether. Right, right. <laughs> if that makes you feel any better. But I do think the last three tracks really, like, is when I'm starting to tune out and kind of like lose interest. I I'm like, I don't remember anything about, I literally, I know, I totally agree. A I, single thing about anything. I totally agree. I remember Men Who Ride Mountains because it traumatized me. <laughs> but like, otherwise. <laughs> I don't remember anything. Everyone knows how over the rainbow sounds. I don't remember how it sounds. I personally I'm like forgotten. that moment. I'm surprised is, you guys don't so like that. It has made me forget a song that's not his. That's extremely popular. His cover of it is much better on Facing Future. But I think it's good here. I hope I, so. I think for his debut, he brought a lot like of charisma and character. You know, as we've coined the phrase, Andrew W.K. effect. You know, Iz is just so lovable. And like his little ad libs he throws in, like Hawaiian boy, aloha, you know, here we go. You know, it's just so much fun. I'm vibing. I'm vibing the whole time. <laughs> I just like when he's being, I honestly like, he comes off way more sweet to me with the like reserved, quieter performances. Kind you know, of. He said he is not, he is, there is no new ground broken on this thing. It is yeah. not like pushing bound, et cetera, so on. It doesn't matter. It's not the point of it. It doesn't exist to do that. The enjoyment comes from these like quiet, Lovely little performances, you know, they're really watered down. These, t you know, every, any adult knows things aren't the same, but that's not why it exists. It's not trying to tackle anything or to, it just is. I feel like he's like the kind guy, you know, in a small town or something, you know, yeah. he, he just has a good heart. That title you know? track and, um, is phenomenal. That's how it comes off to me. That, is that title he track a, is he really beautiful. I don't know. I'm feeling like a light yeah, eight. I love the title track. Yeah. I love the title track. I'm not feeling like a light eight. I think the front half is definitely better, but I think the back half you know, while forgettable, it's just so charming and genuine and just fun that even if I'm tuning out a little bit, I'm still having a good time. And by the time the album ends, I'm just in a great mood. So I think that's what makes it a light A for me is that the vocals from Is and the fun instrumentation that even when it gets forgettable, I'm still put in a good mood. And this might grow off for me. This might grow up for me. I recently discovered this album. I've only been listening to it for like this past month. So, you know, it's just been with me for a while. But I think that what's brought here is a good start for his career and what he would release on. Because his later releases, especially his last two albums, it's way more native to Hawaiian music. Facing Future, though, I think will be an interesting discussion. Like how it compares to this and what it will bring to the table. I was worried of picking it because it's a little long, but... Who knows? Maybe you guys will like that. It has a lot more to offer. So, But I think a light eight is a good ground for me of how I feel about this album. Fuck you I'm guys. I'm going to go Fuck you guys. <laughs> I'm going with a strong five, a light six on some days. I don't think it's a bad record. I think, it, I, like you said, he does bring a lot of charm and charisma to the table. And I can see why he would catch on after the release of this album. I think Is is fantastic. 
I don't think this album is fantastic, but I think he is. And that is why, even though I'm giving this album like a strong five, if you decided that we were going to go back to him for a sequel episode, I'd be all about it. I'd be like, yeah, like I like him. So I want to hear an album that I am going to love. I want to hear an album that I'm going to think is great. This album isn't that for me, but it doesn't mean that he's a bad artist or that you shouldn't check him out, if, especially if you're really want something that's super, super calming and peaceful. Go ahead, Brian. The knife's here. Just take it. Do your thing. Here. Just do it. Look at those nips. Mine are illegal now. Strong four. <laughs> Mine are illegal now. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> Thank God I wasn't drinking anything when you just pummeled me with that. Why do you give it a strong four, Brian? It's mostly not good, but it's not the worst thing I've ever heard. And I wouldn't be opposed to hearing more because there's like, you know, there's there's moments on here I like. But overall, just not fun. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, wow. it's, it's, it's more not fun than it is fun. So that, that's my reasoning. <laughs> There's some good songs on here, but it doesn't make up for the several other not good, super mind numbing songs that make up, you know, just as much of the record and take up more time. <laughs> the record I pick is Fabulous Muscles by Shoo Shoo, an album that is not as funny as its title. Shoo Shoo is a experimental post punk, post pop group headed by mainly. Jamie Stewart and his wife Angela, whose last name I don't know, but it might be Stewart. They have been going at it for since the 2000s, uh, and I think since maybe even the late 90s. But they've been around for a long time at this point. They're a well-established underground kind of experimental band, and this is one just is one of their most praised records. Probably the record that I think you know. I guess a lot of their records get like knife plays before this one and gets a lot of praise, but this one is the one that. I think a lot of people gravitate towards it wasn't how I got into them, but I kind of had to go through the back catalog, find this one and listen to it. And I just thought it's a good place to start a better place to start than when I, than where I did for a lot of people. I think it's not my favorite shoe shoe record, but it is a really good one. So, you know, I just thought it was a good place to start. I want to, you know, I wanted to get the band talked about on the show and I wanted to be able to talk about them in the future. I just had to find a good enough starting point, I think. Because in the past, I feel like I've picked records for bands that's like, uh, maybe this isn't maybe this isn't a good starting point, even though I thought it was. So, you know, trying to stick the landing here so that way if we do a sequels episode, we can get some evolution out of it, you know, or see where their sound is taken. But it's not an easy listen. It's a super harrowing record. I think it's one of the more harrowing ones we've done for the show. Probably yeah. the most. Probably it's, the uh, most. Super heavy. And I guess that this album does have a lot of my favorite qualities about Shushu. And I guess my favorite things about them is they are extremely idiosyncratic and they always take it too far. Jamie's vocal performances are always, always a pleasure. It doesn't matter really what's going on, uh, what, what he's saying, what he's doing. I just really like the way he sings. And then taking it too far, I mean, topically on this album, there's a lot covered. And this record's not even that explicit compared to some of the other tracks or some of the other albums they've released. But I mean, there's still moments that they're just eye widening that are just, they stop you in place and force you to listen to them, particularly support the troops. Oh, but there's also a lot of my favorite, like shoe shoe cuts on this record, like crank heart and I love the Valley and Brian, the vampire clown town, you know, all those songs. Awesome. Fabulous muscles as well. You know, it's not a particular, I, I don't know if it's a record you put on and you enjoy necessarily, but it's the, and there are a few songs on here that are kind of like that, that some I just think are kind of, they're really dark, but they're really beautiful too. Just a lot to unpack, I guess. Just a lot to unpack with this record. So it's not an easy listen in the slightest. And I, and there was no Shushu record I could have picked that was going to be an easy listen. So I figured we might as well start here and see where things go. I think the one thing I would say about this album, coming having listened to it a lot, is um it is a little unkempt it's the flow is sort of is out of sorts it's really all over the place you know from moment to moment there's i don't think there's a lot of reasoning as to why one song is where it is but other than that i love this record a lot i love shushu a lot and i just had i i just had to get him on the show basically it was really the point i did it was just figuring out where to start okay so i'll talk about it sonically first this does sound very very 2004 from a production standpoint, 
Uh, and that's not a bad thing. That's, I actually say that in a positive way. Uh, this sounds like some of the more forward thinking groups that existed around that time. Uh, I get a little bit of early arcade fire in here, just a bit uh, in the way the guitars sound, the way the drums sound, some of the more expressive moments vocally. And I'm not trying to say that Shushu and Arcade Fire are, are really similar, but just the way that there is this emotional release of tension on like, I love the Valley when he yells, like that reminded me a bit of early, early Arcade Fire, where it's just this very emotional situation. Uh, a little bit of like Wolf Parade, just production wise, the way the guitars sound, the way the songs are written. It definitely has like a, not really indie, it's just like this uh, art rock kind of art pop, art rock kind of situation going on here. There's a little bit of electronic stuff uh, that I would compare to like late 70s, early 80s synth punk, like Suicide. There's like a little bit of synth pop in here, but not that much. I can see this album being influential sonically. I can see Shushu. I mean, they are still around, still making music. Maybe not that sounds exactly like this or anything like this. But I, I do see their sound in the music of the 2010s as well. I also think this is a great album. Um, I think that the first couple times I listened to it, uh, I was enjoying it, but I wasn't fully paying attention to everything that was going on. Obviously, there are some songs like Support Our Troops So, where you have to pay attention and it grabs your attention from the very beginning. Um, but there are some vocal there's some lyrics and lines that uh, from the way that he sings and what the production is some quieter moments that get lost in the mix the first couple times if you're not reading along to understand what he's talking about um so i was just hooked by the by the hooks by crank heart and i love the valley fabulous muscles is a great acoustic song you have brian the vampire clown town is super super catchy there are catchy hooks on this record and just sonically, you wouldn't think that it's super, super dark. But when you start getting into the lyrics, uh, this is easily, I think, the darkest album we've talked about. And we've talked about some dark music before. We've talked about, you know, Down Colorful Hill had topics of depression and suicidal ideation. This is less ideation and more him commenting on what he is seeing around him. Shit that's already happened and is going on. From a very personal standpoint, either from people that he knows or just his family. And Jamie Stewart, I mean, God, there's probably a lot that you can read into over the course of Shushu's discography and everything that he's said. It's a very, very tumultuous existence that he documents on this album. Uh, and it's very harrowing. Some of the topics being child sexual abuse, abuse in general by parental figures, serious issues going on uh seeing someone else suffer mental illness and not help themselves and there's just a lot here and like brian said they don't hold anything back they don't really jamie doesn't really sing in metaphor and there are moments on the album that will shock you but they're not for shock value because they're real. It's difficult. It's difficult to listen to. That I've listened to this album four times. You know, the first two times, I was like, yeah, that was a fun album. Great songs on it. Now, knowing what every song is about and having read through all the lyrics and getting the guttural emotions that come out of some of the vocal delivery, this album leaves you feeling pretty hollow inside and pretty sad for the state of humanity. There really isn't any give on this it doesn't slow down for anybody ever track six fabulous muscles very explicit lyrics they kind of make you uncomfortable and that's really i mean that's honestly what i appreciate about this because there's not a lot of artists who can do that and also be worth listening to i think that a lot of the time when you have lyrics that are going to make someone uncomfortable they feel like they're just there for shock value. But here it's so intensely personal that you can't blame him for saying anything that he says because 
it's like he has to say it. He has to get it out somehow. And each song has this very deep personal meaning that it might be hard to relate to, but it will just, if you can empathize and if you put yourself in the position of Jamie, if you put yourself in the position of the people that he's talking about, it's a very emotionally draining experience, but one that's very well worth listening to. All right. Look, I'm going to start off by saying that I don't like most of the music in this album. And I tried. It's kind of like how Brian was with Aphex Twin. I tried. I'm just not into the noise. It's not for me. So with that going in, this album is very half and half for me. It's I'm very split down the middle of how I feel about it. On the one hand, I really respect and admire the level of just no holds bar of the lyrics. But I mean, you mentioned this June, but yeah, it's hard for me to relate to it. It's re- I feel like it's a veteran issue. You know, you had that issue with veteran. It was hard for you to relate to some of the lyrics. Here it is for me too. And I think the problem with that is, is because there's only one single moment of brevity on this album. And I feel like there should have been at least one more. My two favorite songs are I Love the Valley O and Little Panda McElroy especially Little Panda McElroy. I think that is just a beautiful moment on the album. The way he says, I can do it, and that just chord hits, that bellowing chord hits, it's crushing. But there is a sense of hope to it. It reminds me of the line from the movie As Good As It Gets, where Jack Nicholson says, you make me want to be a better man. That's the kind of message I'm getting from that song. So I'm like, okay, we've got some, we've got some brevity here. Fuck me, though. After that, it's just an onslaught of just crushing topics and themes. I mean, fucking Brian the Vampire kills me. And I like that, and I hate that about this album, because it's just like, I want to get into it. I want to really dig deep into what he's singing about, but I don't know, man. It's just, if there was just some more brevity on it, it would have really... And it's only, the album's only 37 minutes. So it's not a slog. It's done pretty quickly. Like, it's a quick listen, honestly. Uh, It's probably the quickest of the albums we've talked about for this week. Now, I do have some actual issues with it. You guys are probably going to hate me. I don't care. Because the vocals are hit or miss for me. Stop. (laughs) Stop. Stop. Stop right there. As soon as you said, Brian, that you love the vocals, I was like, shit, well, here we go, you know. Checks, notes, hate vocals. Oh, Christ. <laughs> I love them. Come on, dude. I love them, and then I don't. Like, sometimes they really work for me, and then sometimes they just don't. They really don't. They really God, don't you work. you are going to hate the next Shushu record. <laughs> yeah. Look, another issue that I have is I don't like Support Our Troops. I think that's the worst song on the album. So the reason I don't like it is because, one, A lot of this album is very introspective. It's clearly about his personal experiences, what he has gone through, and I love that. We've talked about artists that have done that in the past, and I've praised them for it. Then out of nowhere, in the middle of the album, we get this random piece that has no music to it. It's just harsh noise, which I get is the point. So you, like you said, June, you pay attention to what's being said. But we get this random piece that critiques the Iraqi war. Okay, why the fuck is this here? And he's not even really saying anything that's like, hasn't been said before. It kind of makes me mad because it's so one-sided. Like, I don't know what your guys' opinions on war in general or the army. I have a lot of different opinions about it, you know, but I feel like there's a lot you can do your own research on. I don't like how he just comes in and he's like, just so one-sided about the issue. And I hate his vocals on that track. The way he stutters that first line, it makes me mad. Like, it, I don't know. It just really upsets me. And it doesn't help that I don't like the music of that track either. So we just kind of get roadblocked in the middle of the album. So the flow kind of gets jammed for me. So that doesn't help. And then, of course, the back half of this album, from Fabulous Muscles to Mike, is crushing. Like I said, I think one more Little Panda McElroy kind of song in that part of the, the track listing would have really helped. However, I think when this album shines, it really does. I think the music... It enhances the lyrics so much. Like I mentioned on Little Panda McElroy, I think Mike is a crushing song that the the lyrics and the music just 
completely puts that on a silver platter and says, hey, look at this. Look what I've gone through. You know, listen to what I have to say about it. You know, I think the lyrics on Fabulous Muscles are a little too much. Like, they really make me uncomfortable, and I get that's the whole point, but it doesn't leave me wanting to come back. It really doesn't. It just makes me want to turn it off. But the music does enhance that. The acoustic guitar and his faint vocals, that's when I love his vocals. The faintness and the, and the, like, that falsetto he's pushing, it's really hurting his voice, you can tell. Love that shit. And I love that shit in uh, I Love the Valley O. Great fucking song. Bunny Gamer kind of leaves me scratching my head. I really don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah. I don't. I don't necessarily. It's not even it's about like, anything. It's not one of my favorites. It's not anything about like, anything in particular. It's kind of confusing. Yeah. You guys said you like Clown Town. That's another kind of like why is this here kind of song. Oh, you can go jump in a freaking mud. However, bitch. tell me what that song's about because <laughs> I personally do not. What's it about? Uh, that might maybe change my mind because I like the I like the noise. But I'm kind of leaving, scratching my head, like, what's the song about? You know, because most of the lyrics are pretty straightforward. Here's what we're talking about. Clown Town, I'm like, what is being said here? I don't know exactly, honestly. I think it's about being trapped in, like, a ridiculous and scary place is the only thing I've ever been able to liken it to. Mm-hmm. Kind of describing where things are. like, But there's, like, lyrics like Clown Town, no exit, you know? So it's like you're just trapped in this horrible, scary, foreign place. Right. Maybe I or not that. foreign, because I, I look at the verses and it says, you know, your true father has done this, your true love has done this, your true brother has done this, your true self has done this. And then the chorus, you know, clown town, no anything, clown town, single angel, clown town, no exit. It does feel like being trapped like maybe in a location could... with relationships that are not good for you. And it's bringing you down as well. You yeah. just can't get out of this situation. Like maybe you could say it's about how like, you know, when you're trapped in a local town and you want to move on to bigger and better things, but you're trapped there. That's something that maybe you could like clown town. Like maybe you could. I think it's and I, and it's the, uh, yeah. And, and the titles of the songs, I think we should mention because there is a weird almost humor to them that makes it even more off-putting whenever you get into the meat of what they are about like brian the vampire you wouldn't guess because of the title uh, fabulous muscles i love the valley niece's pieces which is almost funny you say oh you have a song niece's pieces sounds like reese's pieces that's probably what the point was maybe it's kind of weird and and strange. I don't know, and it's but kind of in, it's kind of off putting for me. It kind of and you get into the, the lyrics that. of that song, yeah. And it's complete and it's uh, very harrowing. I think that how Jamie will contrast those two things, those two feelings, that just very serious, very harrowing, and this like strange. Why is this song called this? I think that that is kind of what makes them so unique. Mm -hmm. It gives this album a lot of personality beyond just being a dark album. I don't know, man. Uh, I, and it, <sighs> part of what I think is really a very interesting about it. It's just super interesting, engaging. It makes you turn on your brain a bit. Right. And though that by the end of it, you want to turn your brain off and listen to Is. Yeah. To, to, to feel better. Maybe that's why I liked Is more. Uh, yeah, I think it's look. I get it. Very well done. I really album. do get it, and I respect the hell because like it takes a lot of guts to like this is a lot of personal stuff, and to just put that out there. I mean, I couldn't do it. I, I would never ever talk about this kind of stuff in my music. You can tell that this is just a cathartic coping mechanism for him, like for him to put this out there and get that weight off his chest. I just think he makes it too. He does it too much. There's no sense of like. You know, I mentioned in the last episode, you know, what I was worried about with people who eat people, you know, it was going to be a pure comedy situation where, you know, if it wasn't for that final track of pure comedy, this would be like just a fucking depress fest. Here, it's a depress fest. We end with Mike, which is a great song, but holy fucking shit. By the time this album is done, there's like no hope for the world. The end is nigh. The nuclear bombs have dropped. We're fucked. You know, it's... I really wanted another Little Panda McElroy. Just in the middle, like maybe after Brian the Vampire and before Nisa's Pieces, 
uh, one more song with some hope to it would have really made it a little better. Or maybe end with a more, like, hey, there's a lot of crazy shit going on, but, you know, there's still some hope. And no, like, fuck it. Shushu's like, nah, just life sucks. Fuck you. I mean, I think it... And I get that's the point, but that doesn't make me want to come back to it. I think it's admirable it. because it, it's something, yeah, it's going to be hard to connect to, but it's very possible that going through shit like this, you're going to genuinely think that and genuinely be in a place where the music that you make is going to be that hopeless because you feel that hopeless. Right. But and as it's a, not, it's, as a listener yeah, it's though, just, as a listener though, it's, I don't want to come back to this. I don't want to listen to this again. Cause it's just, it's a mood album for sure. Like, unless I want to just be kicked in the groin emotionally, you know, I'm not going to put this shit on. <laughs> kicked in the groin emotionally. Cause that's what it does after like, Oh man, after Fabulous Muscles, like I'm just, <laughs> I was listening to the this music uh, the other day, getting my final listens in, and I was with my girlfriend, and after Little Panda McElroy, I kind of just looked at her with puppy dog eyes and I hugged her, and I was just so sad, and she's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I don't like Brian's album, it makes me sad. <laughs> <laughs> and you knew I was going to hit you when you came in and said it, like yeah, I but fuck you up. That's why we're on a Discord call, bitch, you can't do shit. Dude, no, come on, man. They're not supposed to know that. <laughs> well, you don't think they can tell because of the audio quality? <laughs> That's just a bad mic or something. Brian, tell us why you like this so much. What are your absolute favorites? Crank Heart, Fabulous Muscles, I Love the Valio, Clown Town, Brian the Vampire. Yeah, those, those are, good are picks. Those my, good picks. I mean, those are the tracks that that every time I come back, I'm like, hell yeah, this track. Um, Just talking about, like, I, I don't want to get too Do you guys much like Support the, the Troops? Do you guys like that track? I know you kind of mentioned it, but like, I really think we should talk about that more. I really think it's an eyebrow raiser of why that's, it just feels so For out of place. For what it's worth, Jamie's thoughts on the troops and on uh, members of the military are that. Uh, that is very much his representation, right. very much his approach in interviews. He hates soldiers. If you are a soldier, he's like, why? Why would you be a soldier? Why would you choose that as your profession? Any amount of research would show that the U.S. military is just a murdering, warmongering facade. Uh, so any reason to join is null and void with the simplest amount of research. And yeah, I, I'm not hating for his opinion. Um, I do think it's so a little one-sided. If you join, and he believes if you join, you are joining to kill. You are joining to just be you know you, he's like fuck the troops i mean that's honestly how he feels is fuck the troops yeah fuck them who cares that's how he and feels. i get that i just why is this here though what does this have to do with anything else that's on the album you know every other song on the album is about himself so why do we i think that's about himself it's just another it's his point of view on it and you know the whole album is a dark well, cynical take more wouldn't it less, have made so. more sense to have a song about his personal experience with troops you know like he must, I think that's what must, it is. I think that's his But he personal must have a reason why troops. he feels that way, like, personally. Like, maybe, like, he was friends with a person who was in the military, or he... No, I think it's just an opinion. I don't think you have to have an anecdote to inform your opinion. Well, I the reason I say that gonna... is because that's what the rest of the album is. Every song is that. So I, I just feel confused of, like... Because, like I said, it kind of roadblocks the album for me. Because, again, there's no real music here. It's just harsh noise with the spoken word over it. I don't know. That's just my personal opinion. I could really do without that track, and I think it would flow a lot better. So, yeah, this... I don't hate this album. I don't love this album. I'm so split in the middle, so I think I'm going to give it a decent five. Just right down the middle. On the one hand, there's a lot I like about it. On the one hand, there's, like, so many things that just really make me dislike it. But I tried... Decent eight. Back me up, June. <laughs> I tried. A lot of respect to Shushu. I would be interested to talk about him again, because I think... He brings a lot to the table. I'm going to go with a, like a light eight. Come on, June. What the fuck? Eight. It gets an eight for me. June, it's not high enough. No. Fuck you. Decent eight. So next time, it's going to be a sequels episode uh, where we're going to pick an album by an artist that we've already talked about on the show. It's our favorite segment. And by the time this episode goes up, it's going to have been so long since we recorded the earlier episodes because of the year long break and the fact that we're now no longer all in the same place. And this is no longer a MSPR thing. So, so we're going to go pretty far back for some of these, uh, sequel. And like, if you wanted to hear the original episodes, uh, and the original I was talked about, they will the still exist, but this is going to be yeah. pretty far removed from that. Link in the I'm description with, for previous episodes. Yeah. 
the drones, which we've talked about twice on the show before. We first started with the Miller's daughter. Uh, and then sucked. we talked about feeling kind of free. It was all right. We're going to talk about an album that is sort of in the middle, just chronologically. Uh, it came out in 2008. And it's more of their sort of punky, bluesy rock that is a lot more restrained and a lot more songwriting focused than the Miller's Daughter was. Uh, you're not going to get these explosions. Of, I mean, it can have intense moments, but it's not going to be this just this onslaught of noise. It's uh, much more of an album album, whereas Miller's Daughter was just an onslaught. This is, this is an album with a flow and a front and a middle and an end. There's some folk ear cuts on it too, which I love. Yeah, so Havala, it's my personal favorite Drones album, and it's not one that's talked about very much. People will talk about Wait Long by the River uh, and I See Seaweed. I think Havala is maybe their most obscure album, but it absolutely deserves to be talked about because I think it has some of their best songs on it. Kieran J. Callanan, Bravado. I love Embracism. I love Kieran J. Callanan. I love Bravado. It's very different. <laughs> This album has pretty much decided his trajectory. Embracism doesn't even... The only reason it sounds like a Kieran record is because he sings on it compared to these other records. So, yeah. We're going to move on to his second album. And probably the more popular one, too. Easily. Easily, yeah. His breakout album. It's time to go back to the very, very first episode of Unwarranted Music Opinions. We will be doing the 2018 epic comeback record from Andrew W.K., you're Not Alone, an album that I'm very excited to talk about. I've heard many songs from it. I haven't listened to it all the way through. I know June hasn't heard it. Brian has heard it and he really enjoys it. Should be a fun, fun discussion because I think for most of us, Andrew WK's I Get Wet was the very first album we talked about on uh, the first episode of the podcast and was the first album where it was like, okay, we've got to keep doing the... Unanimous, like unanimous, like enjoyment, you know, like it was like, oh, wait, this is amazing. <laughs> wait, hold on. I love Andrew cool. WK. I know we like Andrew WK a lot. We, we've t coined the phrase, as I mentioned previously, the Andrew WK effect. It's just an artist that's kind of been in the back of our minds ever since the very first episode. So I think it's fitting that for the first sequels back, we talk about him and his epic return album. This has been Unwarranted Music Opinions. I'm June Lindberg. I was here with Brian Courtney. I don't know what to say. I can't think of anything. Say... See you later, or hey, no. or bye, or something, you piece of shit. And Chaz Jenkins. Hey. <laughs> Y'all are bad at this. <laughs> hey, we'll see you next week. We're doing sequels. Yeah. See, see you later. later. See ya. Goodbye. <laughs>